upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. Yeah. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Hallelujah. Go ahead and be seated. I love Ezekiel's response. Ezekiel wasn't crazy. He wasn't going to say no. He wasn't sure about saying yes. He was like, if anybody know, you know God. Glory to your name. So this is a powerful vision that Ezekiel had. A very powerful vision uh, that Ezekiel had uh, of a valley of a, you know dry bones. And then when I was looking at the, the fact that it was an open valley, um, you know, it's, it, when you think about something that's out in the open, it's exposed, it's not covered, it's not protected. But anyway, it says it was an open valley. So these dry bones were symbolic. He wasn't actually in a grave site or anything like that. It was symbolic of um, God's people, Israel. It was symbolic of, you know, where they were in their, in their, um, in their uh, spirit, in their mind, in their soul, in their condition, in their situation, right? So it was, it was literally symbolic of that. They were in captivity. And they had been taken away into um, captivity by the Babylonians. They were in Babylon captivity. And their home, Jerusalem, was destroyed. So they had a lot to be despaired, you know, a lot to be discouraged about. Right. So now the reason why they the, the reasons there were, you know, several reasons, I'll just categorize it or summarize it um, in like three or four uh, statements. But the reasons why they got to that place, they weren't always dry. They weren't always there. But the reason why they got there is for, for one sin. Right. Sin, period. All forms of sin. And it's not just talking about violating or not uh, following or keeping the Ten Commandments. You know, all, uh, you know, fear is sin. Come on. Double-mindedness is sin. Uh, unbelief is sin. You know, so all of these things uh, are, are sin, right? And so when we think about, um, even when I was uh, thinking about things in Revelation, it talks about the fearful, the cowardly, having their place in the lake of fire. So it's not just about sleeping with somebody, drinking this, drinking that, lying, cursing, cheating, stealing. It's not. Those are all sins, but sometimes we want to box it in and say, okay, well, I'm not doing that, or at least I'm not doing this, and I'm not doing that, but what, are you, what else are you doing when we can't see? What's going on in your house behind them closed doors? But anyway, let me just stay focused on my word today because I, I know it's first Sunday. I want to hear what the Lord has given the prophets to release. And we're also going to have communion. So I won't be before you too long. Okay, I'll just say that. Too long. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why they were in uh, captivity in, in Babylon. Idolatry, of course, was the, you know, of course, in, in itself is sin. But um, it was idolatry. And um, anything we put before God, y'all remember the teaching, I think it was last year or maybe the year before that, I can't remember, when I did a teaching series or something like that on idolatry. Because people think that sometimes idolatry is just I'm going to bow to a cow, I'm going to worship a tree, you know, all of those things. And it's like, no, anything that we put before God, whatever it is that is more important than God, that gets our focus, that gets our time, that gets our money, that gets our attention, we are worshiping that thing, we are idolizing it, and we are giving of idolatry okay now this word is you know it's symbolic of what the you know the condition of Israel but what God wants you to see is where you are lying in that uh, situation or in their situation in their state so it was idolatry they were chasing after and serving other gods and they were warned over and over again not to go and mix and mingle with other gods you know, the church today, my God, it's just, you know, I'm not, I promise not to hop on this. But every once in a while when I listen to, um, I got satellite radio. When I listen to the Christian, uh, I forgot the name of the station, but it's a station that just plays Christian music all day long. And from time to time, I hear some old, you know, some old songs that, you know, when we was in the club and, you know, when we wasn't saved and it's mixed with some gut words talking about, they just replaced the words with Jesus. No, I'm not trying to think about Jesus when I'm thinking about Tyrone or whoever I was with back in the day singing that song. Am I, you know, because you're going you're, you're gonna to start singing that song on your head. We ain't forgot them songs. We ain't forgot them songs. What is my point? The, the church has 
all, has um, already over many, many years have mixed and mingled with other gods. He said that those, they that worship me must worship me in spirit and truth. But then we're mixing with other gods. There's many other examples um, of mixing and blending with other gods. But that's one of the ones that you can catch real quick. Different ways. Even in our worship. Even in our dances. I know if y'all been to churches or even been online and seen people doing, you know, the running man and all kinds of things. And I'm like, okay, that was birthed for another god. We do that in the club and all those things. Now, we, I don't go to the club. I just want to make that clear. All right. So they, these, these are things that the world has brought into the church to make the church more exciting, right, to the youth or to, to whomever is there. Right? So they think that, you know what, we God needs some help. So let's come on and, you know, let's go ahead and do the two-step. Let's go ahead and do the, I don't know, what is that, the, 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 all them different, different dances and stuff. So I'm not going to hop on that. But anyway, so just showing you how that there have been many um, uh, examples and many situations where we have a mix. So we're no different, right, than the children of Israel. It's, it's easy to look back and say, my goodness, they, they did this and the point of thing and all of that stuff. Well, we are doing the same thing that they did back then. No different. Different time. Same thing. Different times, same idolatry, right? The same thing. And so that's the reason why God says that the scripture, everything that is written in the word is good for edification, is good for teaching. Because he's like, learn from what was happening at those times, right? Because it's representative of even some of the same things that we are guilty of, but not just the stuff that we're guilty of, even the promises, the blessings, and all of those things. Right? So anyway, it was sin, it was idolatry, and the last one is they rebelled against God and his word. They were taught. It's not like they weren't taught. The prophets and priests were teaching, right? You know, so they knew the word. They knew um, they had plenty of prophecy going on. We can even look at the book of Jeremiah that came before Ezekiel. So they had they were taught. Right? But yet and still, God said, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. And they did the exact opposite of what he said. They, the, their desire and their passions was more important than the will of the Lord. So it was flat out rebellion. So God caused them to go into captivity. And so now we have this imagery of them being in a valley, an uh, 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 open valley, and they're scattered about, looking, you know, like dry Bones. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yes. Right. Okay? Now, there are some things just to kind of make it practical because, I, you know, I want to make sure that you look for yourself in this word and make sure that if you don't find yourself, that you don't, make, that, that you don't get into any of these types of situations. But they, these are all things that contributed to um, their dryness, right, and also continue to uh, contribute to our dryness. So Ezekiel, get ready to go back to um, the verse. But Ezekiel was God's prophet, as you know. And he also was in Babylonian captivity, right? And so even when we think about, you know, sometimes we think that we're just living righteous and all that stuff and we ain't supposed to suffer. No, whatever is, the, whatever is going on in the land is going to have an impact, yeah. right? God is still going to cover us. He's going to bless us and all of those things. If we are righteous, if we are standing for him, if we are not rebelling against him, but sometimes we are, we, uh, it's like, you know, I won't even say friendly fire, but it's like we are, um, uh, impacted by the things that are surrounding us. Like COVID, we were all impacted by it, right? All, every believer, you know, even people who um, were saved died, um, you know, by COVID and other kind of plagues and stuff like that. So that's just my point. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, if, if we are righteous, we're still depending on what's happening to the body as a whole. We all have, you know, or some, for the most part, have some kind of, uh, you know, um, reaction or something to it. But anyway, so back to the vision. It says in the it says in this open valley there were very many bones and they were very dry. So he didn't even just say they were dry, he said very dry. Very dry, almost like bleach dry. Okay? So now signs of dryness because as we go through this teaching, as I go through this passage, you know, I want you to be able to identify with where you could potentially be in a dry place because God wants to heal you of your dryness. He wants to saturate your bones with his spirit, right? So God wants to change your situation. Even though Israel, um, they were they were there because of their own deeds. They were there because of the, their disobedience and their rebellion. They were there, but God still has mercy. He still has compassion. And even when we misstep, we make a mistake, we fall. God is still, he is still, my God. 
and unless we've been turned over, and it takes a it takes a long time, and it takes you know it takes quite a bit of time to be turned over to a reprobate mind, where God's like, you know what, I've warned you over and over again, I'm done. There's no more grace for you. There's no more repentance for you. So it takes a long time. He doesn't wait for us to just make one, two, three, four, five, six, seven mistakes, and then just cast us out. So He has mercy. So even though they continue to rebel against Him, they continue to to um, harden their hearts against Him, even though they continue to chase after other gods, he still was looking upon them with mercy. He's like, okay, I see their dryness. I see their deadness. And he wanted to minister to them. Right? So now signs of dryness in our own lives, you know, here today, you know, to make this relevant to you and practical to you is heaviness and weariness. Right? Heaviness and weariness is a sign that you are in a dry place. If your bones are dry, your situation is dry, you are in a dry place. Right? Walking around and we just can't even hold our head up. We, you know, wake up, you know, we think about the way we wake up sometimes. I know sometimes we wake up, we may be a little tired, but we wake up and our mind immediately goes to everything that's negative, everything that's, you know, um, uh, that does not have a good report. Instead of waking up and saying, glory to God, I'm alive another day. Thank you, Father, for breathing breath in my life today. I don't know what this day this day has in store for me. I don't know what you're going to have me to go through, but I thank you for giving me life. I thank you for breathing breath in my body. And we can be more grateful. And we can show God gratitude. Yes, yes, right? Yes. But when we're heavy and when we're weary, it snatches those very words out of our mouth. Yes. But I'm telling you, you got to press. Come on here, you got to press on through. Because yeah. I've been in, even in times of prayer when you're going and you're praying and sometimes it feels like you're you're um, you're um crying out and all that and it's just like the ceiling is right here, right above your head and then your prayer's not going nowhere. That's an indication that you need to press even more. Because yes. God's not the one that put the ceiling there. Come on. All right, so anyway, heaviness and weariness. Absence of strength. And I'm not talking about physical strength. I'm talking about spiritual strength. Like you just feel like I just got... You know, it's, it takes everything just to get up out of the bed, right? To make a phone call, to kick, to take, to cook dinner, whatever it is. Everything is just because our spirit is low, right? Our spirit is low and we just not, you know, we just don't have strength, okay? Uh, feeling far away from God is another indication that you're in a dry place. Feel like, you know, and he says that we are the ones that are, you know, um, carried away with our own, you know, lusts and temptations and things like that. Yeah, he said, I ain't moved. You did. He said, I didn't move. So when we feel far from God, that's because we veered out of, come on, we veered out of his protection. And now we're in this open valley where it's burning hot. Think about it. Well, I'll say that when I get back to I want to. I'm, I'm trying to stay focused. I want to give y'all all of this. Let me give you the rest of these. Feeling far from God. Can't see or hear, right? You can't see your way clear. You can't hear anything, right? God says, my sheep know my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. And so regardless of what your status is, you can be a prophet, you can just be a son or daughter of God. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you have a title or a mantle or whatever. The bottom line is as his disciple, as his sheep, you have the ability to hear his voice. He says you're supposed to. But when we're in a dry place, right, we don't hear nothing. We don't see nothing. Don't hear nothing. Don't see anything. Last thing is oppressed, stressed, and depressed. I know those three things, but I just sunk them up all in one. Okay? Yeah. We're dealing with oppression. We're dealing with stress. And we're depressed, right? Those are all signs, right? We can just picture and imagine ourselves that we wanted them bones scattered around in that open valley. It's a dry place. It's a dry place. Proverbs, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you the title of my message. You probably already got it. But the title of the message today is It's Time to Come Out of Your Dead and Dry Place. It's time to come out. Of that dry place. Because even when something is dry, it's indication that it's dead. It's spiritual, it's, it's, it's blindness, it's, it's, it's death, right? Spiritually speaking, right? Because if God is within us, come on, the scripture says this, you know, um, he that's in us is greater than anything that can come against us in this world. Amen. But if we don't, if we don't sense him, Right? It's like we, we go, we revert back to the, the, the place of being dead because unlike the children of Israel, we have those of us who belong to God, have the spirit of God dwelling in us. Right? 
And if we, we, if we can't even tap into the God that's on the inside of us, the fullness of the Godhead, that's an indication that we have reverted back to a spiritually dead state. And that is not the will of God for you. That is not your portion. Amen. God says, come out from that place. Right? It says, come out of it. That means that even though his will is, he had Ezekiel prophesying it to these dead bones, but there were still things that the children of Israel had to do. Right? They had to do it uh, do it as well. So anyway, Proverbs 17, 22, you don't have to go there. Stay there because we're going to continue. I'm going to continue to walk Ezekiel 37, and then we're going to go over into some other passages, and I'm watching my time. I, the, 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 what, I, what God really wants to do today is to stir your face, first of all, to identify where you are, to identify, am I one of, the, am I one of those bones that's scattered in that open valley? Come on in. And if I am, what is the, how do I get out of there? What is it that I, that I have to do to get out of that place? God wants to, he is not pleased. Come on, when we are blessed, we glorify God. Right? When we're walking around and people can see the glory of God on our life, we're in the store, we're shopping our family members, but if we always got a sad story, we always got a tell the tale, come on. Don't have nothing good to say, come on. We don't give God glory. He says, he says if, you know, if we lift him up, right, he will draw all men. But if, when we're complaining, when we're whining, Come on here. When we're focused on and distracted by the cares of a life, we're not lifting him up. So guess what? Even though you're supposed to draw when you're out there, you know, with among the people, among the, you know, the people of this world, you're supposed to draw them, you're deterring them. Because they're like, I don't want to, if you, if that's what it takes, you got to deal with it. That's okay. You keep your Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Right. You, you keep Jesus because uh, I don't, I don't want to look like you. Goodness, you can't even smile. But Proverbs 17 and 22 says, Mary does good like medicine, but a broken spirit drives the bones. This is one last thing. A broken spirit drives the bones. So even being in, even when your spirit is broken, you are also in that valley. Come on here. That valley of dry bones because your spirit is broken. Because of discouragement. Because of disappointment. Because of loss. Because of relationships. Whatever it is, our spirit is broken. And when our spirit is broken, come on. When our spirit is broken, we are now in that dry and desperate and thirsty place. That is not the will of the Lord for you. So now let's go on to verse 4. Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, let's go on to verse 4. It says, again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So looking back at the first verse, the first thing that has to take place is for you to find out what the word of the Lord has to say about your condition, about your situation. The first thing that he said, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Sometimes we are cancer. We don't want to hear no, we don't want to hear no sermon. We don't want to hear no good news. We don't want to hear what God's will is for our life. When you are in a dry place, the only thing you want to hear is God fix it. The only thing you want to hear is that this situation is going to turn around. You want to hear how you are the victim. You don't want to do, no, you don't want to hear the but You have to speak. He says prophesy. He says, prophesy and say, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Mm. So you go and you search out the scriptures and you begin to look at, okay, where is it? Because there's nothing new under the sun. I know sometimes we act like what we're dealing with ain't in the Bible. Come on, we act like there's no solution, there's no word, there's no hope for us in the scripture. But we got to search it out. So what is it? What is it that we're dealing with? What conditions are we um, afflicted with day after day? We got to go to the word of God. Sometimes even, you know, it's good. We The scripture tells us to pray for one another. We're supposed to pray for one another. But we ourselves got to open up our own mouth and prophesy to our own dead situation yeah. so that life can come back into it. Hallelujah. What does the word say? 
You know, even if it's finances, for example, if you don't have to go there, I'll read it to you. Deuteronomy 28 and 12. If it's finances that drove you into a dry place, speak the word over it. And you go and you declare and you proclaim Deuteronomy 28 and 12 um, and through 13. It says the Lord will open, the Lord will open to you his good treasure. Come on here. You got to speak that to your dry place. Come on, you got to look at your bank account. You got to log into Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase. I don't care what your bank is. If you got to open it up, you got to open up your wallet. I don't care. And you begin to speak to it. And you say to you, you says the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. What are you putting your hands at to work to do? Come on, let me just finish proclaiming this day. It says you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. You ain't supposed to be saying, hmm, I've always been struggling. I can't seem to get a way through. I can't get... No, you got to speak to it. Uh-uh, I am the vendor. I am not the borrower. Verse 13, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Come on here. You better prophesy to that dead thing. I am the head. I am not the tail. Come on. You shall be above only and not beneath. If you... If, come on, there's a condition here. If you heed, going back to the first... The, the fourth verse, old dry bones here. Okay. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today and are careful to observe them. So the scripture has all kinds of solutions for us. Come on. Is it spiritual warfare that you're dealing with? Prophesy, uh, uh, prophesy the word of the Lord to it. There's many scriptures. I have just two here. Ephesians 6 and 11 says, I place upon myself. Come on, you see how I kind of changed that? I place upon myself the whole armor of God that I will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yes. Come on, you yes. speak to that pit. Yes. Come on. It also says in Luke 10 and 19, behold, he has given who? Me. Authority to trample on serpents and scorpions yes. and, and over all the power of the enemy. Mm. And nothing by any means shall hurt me. So we're looking at the scripture. Where do you find yourself? Is it your mind? You got to prophesy to your mind. You say, mind, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. Come on. The scripture says to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Come on. You got to prophesy to it. The prophesy to it. The problem is we don't want to do the work. We just want God to fix it. Can you just fix it, Jesus? Can you just fix it? Don't you see what it's doing to me to be in this state? We want him to, to fix it. And he says, no, you got to heed my word. So that means you got to be in it. Come on here. That's the last thing folks want to do when they're struggling, whatever, whether it's spiritually, mentally, physically. The last thing they want to do is open up their Bible and read it. It's the last thing. But we got to know what the word says. Search it out. It works. Because when we, are, when we as the body of Christ are walking around with our head held down, and we don't have a testimony to nobody, yeah. right? We are literally making God look like he don't work. Yeah. We are bringing a reproach to him. Yes, God. <sighs> yes, Lord. My God, got to look at it. It's mine. You know, so anyway, let me keep on going. So back to verse 7. Back to verse 7 in Ezekiel 37. Actually, I, I will come back to verse 7, but I want to drop down to verse 11 real quick. Let's drop down to 11 real quick. We'll come back up to 7. Because he says here, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So he was talking about his people then. But again, he wants you to see yourself because you are his people. Come on here. And you done crept into a dry place just like they did. He says, These bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry. Our hope is a loss. And we ourselves are cut off. My God. They identify. And our, our bones are dry. We don't have no hope. And when I think about hope, because that's, that's another thing that many people struggle with, especially when you're dealing with the same thing over and over again, and when you're faced with it year after year after year, and it's like, okay, there is no hope. Why am I even going to pray about this anymore? Why am I even going to believe God about this thing anymore? Right? Hannah is a great example of one who had no hope. Right. Come on, come on. First of all, she was barren. Hannah was dry. Did you catch that? Yeah. She was barren. There was, there was no, it was, it was, her, her womb was unfertile. It was dry. She was barren. She was in a hopeless condition, a hopeless state. She was mocked by, come on, her, her, um, her husband's other wife, right? She was mocked by her. 
You know, so she had to, so you got the enemy whispering in your ear. It may not be an actual person, but you got the devil in your ear. Mm -hmm. God ain't going to do this for you, and, and God ain't going to do that for you, and that, and that, and that, and that, and see you fail, and see you made a mistake, and God ain't listening to you. God don't hear your prayers. It may not be a penina, but it's the enemy in your ear that's continuing to mock you and to discourage you regarding the situation or place that you have, that you have found yourself in. It's the enemy. So she had that. Even though, you know, she got people that didn't even get her. Her husband didn't get her. Her husband was like, listen, you know, this is in 1 Samuel. Her husband said, am, am I not good to you, more, more, uh, better than you than 10 sons? Right? He couldn't understand why if she was so downtrodden. He didn't get why she was in that place the way she couldn't even speak. She couldn't even utter the words of her prayer, of her petition before the Lord. She was in a dry place. Her husband didn't get her. The priest didn't get her. He like, woman, you drunk? So he know what. So here it is that you just feel in a place all by yourself. Sometimes again, we feel like we are all by ourselves. Nobody else is dealing with or experiencing what we are experiencing. It's just me. We like Elijah under that what in that in that cave. And the Lord's like, where you? What you doing here? Oh, it's just me, Lord. I'm the only one left. Come on here. That's how you may not say those words, but that's how we act. So you feel like you're in this place where nobody understands. Y'all gonna turn that air down. Nobody understands. Nobody gets you. It's a place of hopelessness. But one of the things I love about Hannah is even though she was in a dry place, she knew where to go to get her breakthrough. The scriptures say, when you go back and look at it, and we don't have time to go to it today, but it says year after year, she went to the house of the Lord. She went with, she got year after year after year. The, year, the, the scripture doesn't say how long. Come on. So I know you've been dealing with that situation year after year after year after year, right? That's where hopelessness begins to speak. Come on. Hopelessness is like, hey, here we go again. Yeah, I know you're going to the house of the Lord, but uh, you know, we was here last year, and we was here the year before, and nothing ain't changed. Nothing's moved. Right? God ain't listening. So she kept going. Come on. She kept going. Yeah, she, even though she was at a place of hopelessness, she kept going. We got many, many examples in the scriptures about people who were in, who were at the state of being hopeless. When you're in hopelessness, I can add that to the list above. That's dry. That's dryness. But she had to do something. Come on in. She had to keep going before the Lord. I know. I understand that you've been dealing with the same sickness for many years. That you've had this, this struggle, this struggle for many years and you don't see it moving. Hmm. But God's talking to you today. He says, I'm going to cause the skin, I'm going to cause the flesh to come back on your situation. I'm going to cause the life to come back into that thing. But he says you got to heed the word of the Lord. You got to heed what he says and you got to observe to do them. Come on. You got to speak. You got to prophesy. He gives us instructions in the word on what we ought to do to get out of our dry place. That's why he says come out. He didn't say I'm going to pull you out. He says you come out of your dry place. Okay. Let me get back to. Okay. Where was I at? Let me go. Okay. Back to verse 7. Because I wanted you to see that he was, you know, with the condition, the mindset that they were in. All hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. Well, I wanna, before I start reading verse 7, when you are um, um, in, in your dry place, in your dry season, you feel like there is no blessings flowing for you. Come on, you feel like God has cut you off. Like, you know, you a step, you, know, you ain't even a stepchild no more. You know, you got kicked out the wheel. Come on. And his word doesn't apply to you. Come on, we can feel like they, they will come off. They were, but they were warned. They were warned, and God warns us. You know, they they had the, they had uh, some scripture. They had whatever was written and penned at that time. But we have the entire word of God. Not only do we have the entire word of God, we have his spirit dwelling on the inside of us. It snatches the excuse or should snatch the excuse out of our mouth as to why we are hopeless, why we feel like we are cut off. Why we feel like God is not there. God is not answering. Come on here. Verse 7, it says, okay, this time he's going by quick. It says in verse 7, he says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Come on, when you begin to speak, things begin to move. He says, as I prophesied, there was a noise and a suddenly and suddenly a rattling. Come on here. And the bones begin to come together bone by bone. It's not going to happen all at once. 
Come on. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a process that we have to go through. And I love this description in the word where he basically is describing how he put man together. He says, look, we first we have the bones. Right? Then he says the sinews, which is basically the tendons, the muscles, and all of that. Then he said the flesh, right? So it's, it's this process of putting you back together again. Right now, you scattered all over the place. Your mind over there across the country, come on here, your mind at work, you're scattered. Yes, yes. I said, you got to bring that back in. Bring your pieces back together again. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Come on. He says, uh, he says indeed, I have, um, did I read that verse? No. No, okay, I didn't read it. Thank you. All right, so the rattling. So when I was thinking about the rattling, I was like, my God, the things are, you know, there's a shaking. There's a rumbling that comes, that, that begins to take place as we declare not our word, but his word. Yes. Because the scripture says his words are what? Life. life. They are spirit and they are life. Yes, God. We're not speaking the right things. We think a whining and a complaint is going to change our situation. But when you speak to the word of the Lord, to your condition, to your situation, there's a rattling that begins to take place. But then you got to be very careful. you got to be very careful because even when the rattling, and you said, remember he says in there that the bones begin to come together one by one. And sometimes because we don't get an immediate result, we don't see that thing change right then, we begin to get discouraged. we got to understand there's a process. Because it wasn't overnight that you got broken. Come on here. It wasn't overnight that your spirit got broken. Right. That you got scattered. That your mind was all over the place. Yes. Come on. That you continue to veer outside of the will of God. Verse 8 says, Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Yes. Mm. <laughs> My God. So even at, that, even at the place of being scattered and bringing the pieces back together again, there was no breath, meaning his spirit wasn't in them. Meaning that he had to he had to give the spirit to, in order because spirit is what is life. Life, life. Yeah. So he says there was no there was no breath, and he said there was no breath in them. Verse nine. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, yeah. prophesy, O man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may yeah. live. And that breath, even though he's talking about it coming from the four winds, it is representative of his spirit. Yeah. Come on here. Sometimes we are too busy doing stuff that he ain't got nothing to do with. Right. And we're wondering why it ain't moving. We're wondering why it's not, it's, it's not, uh, we're, it's not displaying the fruit. We're wondering why. Right? But sometimes it's because his spirit ain't there. Yes. Woo! Jesus. Okay, let me just keep on going. So he says, I prophesied as, as he commanded me, and breath, ain't, and breath came into them. Mm. And they lived and stood up on their feet. Come on here. Yes. I said, he want to. And I love the when he talks about the feet. It's a it's not just the you know, he says he stood them up on their feet because just imagine, I want you to picture this. And you probably can search the internet and look at you know people's different illustrations and, and, and artwork of what these dry bones may have looked like. Right? It wasn't even a form the whole a whole skeleton, it was just bones scattered. Yeah. But then as you look at this, you're like, My goodness, hmm. You begin to look at it and you say, Okay, if I'm looking at this dry bone. God brings the bones together. He puts the skin all over me. Now I'm on my feet. I'm upright. Come on. So when he put them on their feet, that was representative of them being upright. upright. Okay? So then he says, mm, I love the word when it says that he will make our feet as what? As high as feet. Come on. Well, we begin to leap over things. We begin to leap over situations. Come on. We begin to leap over obstacles and struggles. Glory to God. So they were upright. So we put them on their feet. He says, um, son of man, these bones. Okay, I already read that, but I'll go ahead for the sake of the scripture. Actually, let me go back to 10. It says, so I prophesied. This is, I'm so excited because I want you to get this, but let me slow down. I want you to get this because it is not God's will for you to be in that stuck dry place. That is not his portion for you. Come on, when I think about it, he says, you know, when I think about the treasures and all those things in heaven, and his treasures is just not money. Come on, I know sometimes we think it is. But when I think about all that he wants to release to his people, and the only thing standing between you and the release of the, the heavens opening over your life is your dryness. Mm. Of you not being upright upon your feet. Of his spirit not being in you. And sometimes, you know, the spirit is there, but we don't quench it. Right? And so we now we got to bring that thing back up. Glory to your name. 
So he says, so I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Come on, this is what Jesus is coming back for. Come on, he said, how are we going to war with him, right? And we all spread out all over the place. Our mind over here, our faith over there, you know, we're just scattered, right? He says, an exceedingly great army. Now, of course, when in, in the literal sense, in this prophetic vision that he's given them, he's talking about the future state of Israel. But he's also talking to you. This is symbolic of even what's taking place in your own life. God needs you to overcome. He says that you are more than conquerors, right? And so when you get to that place to where you overcome your dryness, now you are ready and armed for war. He says an exceedingly great army. Verse 11 says, then he said to me, again, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Verse 12 says, therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, all my people, I will open your graves. Come on, he says, even though you dry and dead, I'm going to open up that grave. Come on, I'm going to take them grave clothes off of you. He says, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Come on, that land flowing with milk and honey. He wants to bring you into the land that he promised you. Mm, my God, I hope y'all are catching this. He says, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Of course, he's talking about the future state. You know, we can even look at the resurrection about him bringing the people out of the grave, and even at his second coming, and all of those things. But even now, he says, I want to resurrect you today. Come on here. I need you to come. I need your bones to come back together. I need the stimulus. I need the, the attendance. I need all of that stuff to come back together so I can breathe, put you on your feet, and breathe my breath in you, so that now you can be productive. I can put you in the place, come on, that land flowing with milk and honey, that all the promises of God are released to you. Come on. He says, I, it, God wants you to have it more than you want to have it. Come on. I just want you, I need you to get that. He wants you to have it more than you want to have it. Come on. Who? Jesus. Okay, I got through Ezekiel 37. Okay, y'all give me like five more minutes. Ten. Ten more minutes. Okay, I'll get ready. Okay, okay. I, I want I want us to close out. Let, let's go to um, Psalm ninety-one because this is something, especially when you are in a dry place, in a in a um, you know downtrodden. You're you're dealing with so many things. Your spirit is broken. You know, and all of those things. You that you should be meditating on this psalm every single day. Yeah. Every single day, meditating on it. And when you're meditating, think about all of the words that it, that's being used in here and what they represent. Glory to God. God gives us the answer. Psalm 91. God gives us the answer. But we got to stop being lazy, y'all. Come on here. Why he got his spirit in you if he, if he going to do everything? I, I'm just saying. Like, why he going to give you all these gifts and talents? He going to give you his word. And it's a, you know, that's just like you going over somebody's house and you asking them. You know, they go, they come to your house. Let's put it that way. They come and ask you for some sugar. And you give them some sugar. They're like, oh, okay, can you give me some eggs too? Yeah, I need some eggs. Okay, you got some flour? Come on. And you want all this stuff. And then you, you might, they might as well say, if it was me, I'm like, okay, you want me to, you want to just come in so I can cook it for you? Right, right. Why don't you just come in? Why don't you just come in and let me bake it for you? We don't want to do anything just lazy. Uh, it, it just speaks to lay. I know it was that earlier this year. I can't remember. I think it was earlier this year that I was talking about that. Yeah. Being slowful. Come on, instead of being a slugger. Come on, and not being like that ant. Come on. That ant was productive. That was your first sermon. <laughs> uh -huh. He said, he gives up. Oh, we got to do. Sometimes the answer is oh, it's in your mouth. Come on. This is in your mouth. Y'all at Psalm 91 yet? Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, Psalm 91. We're going to read the whole thing. It's not that long. It's okay. He says, and in, in, in verse 1, he says, he who dwells in the secret place. The problem is, I'm going to try not to stop through the whole thing, but this thing be inside me. The problem is we don't dwell. Right? Come on. We in and out. We back and forth. If you're double-minded, right, you're not dwelling.
Come on here. Because your mind is over here and it's over there. You're not dwelling. He says, he that who he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. When I think about shadow, think about the shadow being shade. Come on. Think about how them bones got dry. Well, we already know spiritually speaking how the bones got dry. But just think about when you're outside, you know, and it's Sunday. Y'all know Texas is hot. And it's going to be hot. I can already tell it's going to be hot this summer. It's going to be hot. Right? And when you're outside and that sun is beaming down on you, what are you going to look for? You're looking for shade. Shadow is representative of shade. Come on in. When you think about grass that's under um, a tree or under a shade tree or under shade, it, it grows beautifully. It's all plush. And it's all green. But what did that, what did that grass look like that's in, the, that's in the open valley in the sun? It burned. It's some ugly grass. It burn up. You don't even see. Don't even green no more. It's brown. Come on, he says. That's where we're supposed to dwell. If we stay there, no matter what condition or what state or situation we find ourselves in, if we just dwell right there, we'll continue to be under his shadow, and we won't get dry. Yes, God. Oh my God. We won't get dry. Come on. He says, I will say of the Lord, he says, uh, uh, um, uh, in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Uh, I'm just going to say this real quick. I can say a whole lot just about that second verse, but that's the key there. The problem is while we end up getting dry, while we end up coming out of the shadow, the reason why is because we don't trust him. We sing about trusting him. We say, Lord, I trust you. But then when it comes to, when things start, that it keeps looking the same way it's been looking. And then all of a sudden, we start looking God upside his head and saying, I thought he was going to do it. And so now we lose it. We lose our trust for him. Yes. We lose confidence. Trust is confidence. Yes. And so when we lose confidence, we don't longer trust him. Then you know, when you don't trust somebody, what you start doing? Ha ha, you start backing up. You start backing up. The shade over here. And then here you are backing up. And then now you're in this scorching open valley, burnt up. Right. And dry, looking crazy. Yes. He says, you are my refuge and fortress. That means he is the place of protection. Yes, Come on, Jesus said that in this life we're going to have trials, tribulations. He said all of that. He says, but be of good cheer. Yes, Come on. He says, I have overcome the world. These things are temporary. Yes, but we make it seem like we're going to be here forever and ever. Amen. Verse 3, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. Come on, feathers also provide what? It provides shade. It provides a shadow. It's, a, it's, a, it's protection. But again, if we can't skip, we've got to keep in mind verse 2, talking about in him will I trust. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings. Come on, wings. Come on, wings. Wings, and, and not only am I under a shadow, but the wings is a breeze. Come on here. You know the wings ain't flapping. Come on, you feel the breeze. Come on, you get cooled off. He says, and, and um, he says, under the wings you shall take refuge. His truth, not your situation, not what you see with your eyes. Come on, not what the situation looks like, not what the doctor said, not what they say. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. He says, all you got, he says, even this calamity and destruction that's coming upon the wicked, yeah, we're going to see it, but but even with a, the the only a piece or a breath of what the wicked is going to experience, we're not gonna we're not gonna experience it. Probably just a whiff of it. He says, with your eyes you gonna see the reward of the wicked. Verse nine, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. Come on, that well it says it again. You have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Some of y'all angels ain't got nothing to do. Because you out there in the sun, in that dry up place. You're not dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And they're like, well, can we just come back home? 
He says, I will give my angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. In their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So not only do you have his help, you got his word. Remember, we prophesied to the bones. We got trust. We got all of those things. Then he got his angels that's covered, that, that, his angels that are there to protect you. So you got heavenly backup. Yes, God. <laughs> Come on here. You got heavenly backup. He says, let's, stay, let's you dash your foot against the stone. And I'm closing. He says, verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Look at what, look at his promises are. If you just dwell right there, right? If you dwell right there, if you trust him. He says, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, this is God talking about you. This is not, uh, it's not to the psalmist, it's not talking about it the other way around. This is what he's saying from God. This is what God is saying in quotes. In your scripture, it should be, in your passage, it should be in quotes. This is what God is saying to you, people of God. He said, because he has set his love upon you, therefore I will deliver you. I will set you on high because you have known my name. Yes. Mm. He, he says, you will call upon him. God says, you will call upon me and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you with long life. I will satisfy and satisfy you and show you my salvation. God is not a man that he should lie. We make God look like a whole liar the way we are representing our lives in front of other people. We got to show people that God works, that his word is true. That means we got to trust them. We got to dwell there. We only end up in a dry place when we come from up under his shadow. When we come up, up out of his protection. When we start to get carried away with what's in our mind. Right? And going to speak in the word of our mind. Let mind, I can tell my mind to cast down imaginations and strongholds. Pull down these strongholds. Come on, we got to speak to this thing. But again, going back to what I was just wrapping up with, he said, you've got to speak. He, mm. Jeremiah 31 and 25 says this. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I, can, I, I believe y'all got what God wanted to say. Uh, Jeremiah 31 and 25. It's just one scripture I want to read. It's just one scripture. But it continues to talk about how God doesn't want us dry. He doesn't want us weary. He doesn't want us, uh, you know, he, he doesn't want us uh, mm, in a thirsty, dry, sad, downtrodden place. He doesn't want that for us. It's just one verse I wanted to read. It says, for I have satiated the weary soul and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. The reason why we end up dry is because we have sorrow in our soul. Whether it is, again, lack, disappointment, stress, health problems, whatever. Whatever it is that breaks our spirit. And then we begin to look at God and we begin to declare the word. God, you said, mm, you said, God, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, yeah. that you would raise up a standard against him. But God, you're not raising up a standard. I don't understand why I'm still here year after year after year. Why? raise up a standard God against the enemy and you know what his response is because you stop dwelling come on here come on let's stand he said I didn't change I didn't move my shadow has still been here this shade the protection the refuge his fortress he said it's always been there if you are dry it's because you didn't dwell you moved you lost faith you lost trust. And remember he says without faith it is impossible to please him. Impossible. And if we don't please God we're not entering into the kingdom of heaven. That's just the bottom line. He says you didn't dwell. And only stand if you can. Don't worry if you can. He says you gotta dwell. You gotta dwell. You gotta dwell. Come on here. And you begin to get that thing on your mind. What is it? What is it? You be like, okay, God, yeah, I'm gonna dry right here. Come on, I'm gonna dry right there. Come on, lift your hands. This is that. I don't say what I had to say. 
I done gave you what the word of the Lord is. Now it's time for you to identify, right? Because now what we have to do is identify, right? And put up under our feet everything that has driven us into a dry place. What is that thing? What is it? I love the scripture when he talked about the bones rattling. And as you begin to speak your word, I can pray for you. I can do all of that stuff. But it's when you prophesy over your own situation. When you prophesy over your own dryness. When you prophesy over your own deadness. That's when an immediate rattling. And you got to stand in faith. You can't just repeat words. You can't just recite words. You got to believe it. You got to have faith. There has to be power. In the words that you're releasing out of your mouth. Come on here. You can turn it up that way. The people can pray out loud. I mean, don't blast us out of here. But I want you to begin to prophesy to your own situation. We're going to come on here. We're going to add this. Now y'all been taught. Now this is your activity. Come on. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on. You got it. I know. I know there's some dry places in here. I know there's some dry bones in here. Come on. There's some there's some um, some complacency, there's some stagnation here. I know it is, I know it is. So you gotta identify, you gotta identify, okay God, okay God. Yeah, I, I lost faith, I lost trust. I, I I didn't I didn't believe you were gonna do it. It, it just, you know, just like it was year after year after year after year after year. And year after year after year, they didn't change He said, But you still should have kept dwelling, you still should have kept believing, you still should have kept trusting me. Glory to God. And sometimes uh, when we are, when we find ourselves in a dry place and God hasn't moved, He's showing you how you are what He's showing you where you are in Him. He's showing you what's in your own spirit. He's not punishing you. Because that's what the enemy would have you to believe. That God is punishing you for a past life. Or the, the, your, what you've done years ago. Come on. What you did years ago. What you said. Your mistakes. The enemy wants you to believe. And the reason why. Come on here. You're struggling financially because you didn't tie it way back then. Because you stole somebody's money. You was a whole, you know, whatever it is. But he says that when we come to Christ, everything, and I remember when I got saved, it took me a, it took me a minute. Because the enemy, I've told y'all this testimony before, everybody didn't hear it. But I told y'all this testimony before. Well, I felt like my mind was my enemy. All I could think about day and night is everything I did wrong. And this is even after receiving Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I was so excited about Jesus. But the enemy is real good. Come on, it's not just his fault. It's also ours. But he, he's real good at replaying the tape. He's real good at replaying those, those, uh, those sins that you did that nobody else know about. Come on. Except you and whoever was there. You and whoever was involved. And so he keeps replaying the tape. And he replays the tape. And he replays the tape. And had you in a position, in a place of guilt and condemnation. Condemnation does not come from God. Condemnation comes from the devil. If you are feeling condemned about anything, that's not God. That's the devil. And you have to rebuke him. What does the scripture say? It says if you resist him, he will flee from you. And so I was sitting there in my mind and, you know, even talk, you know, in this, this, all these thoughts. I had no peace. I had no rest in my mind. God showed me how to have my mind to dwell in him. Because I cried out to God. I'm like, God, I need to help me with this because I don't know what to do. I was still young in Christ. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, okay, this thing ain't, it said, uh, I'm saved and I believe and I, you know, I feel you, I know, I feel all of that, but this, it wouldn't shift. And he taught me how to make my mind to dwell. He says, every time the enemy brings up your past, and I got a dark and dirty past, y'all, come on here. I ain't standing up here with no Holy Ghost food in my mouth when I was born. Come on, all of us got something that we did. Something, some kind of life that we had lived that was not pleasing to God. I didn't know God. I did what I did. I sinned. I sinned real good. Come on, like we all did, you know, before we came to him. So I was like, he says, every time that comes back up, he says, I want you to praise me for it. I want you to speak the word. Just like he was telling, I just thought about this just now. Just like he was telling me, see, you know, prophesy to those dread bones, those dead bones. I begin to prophesy to that situation. I begin to speak to it. I was like, God, thank you uh, that I'm no longer this or that. I thank you for delivering me from this place. I thank you. And all, all of praise. Come on, I, don't I just go up in the praise. I go up in the worship. The enemy can't stand that. But see, the thing is, when you are dry, he shuts your mouth. Come on, when you thirsty, you don't want to talk. 
Come on, when you try, you don't want to say nothing. You, you don't want to say anything. So his, his goal is to get you to shut up. And you got to open up your mouth. So God taught me. He says, speak to it. He says, praise me every single time. And it was a discipline. He didn't say every other, every, every other time or every once in a while. It was consistent. And I trained my mind to dwell there. We even got to train our soul to dwell there. The psalmist said, why are you downcast, oh soul? Come on, we got to even speak to our own soul. Commanding our soul to bless the Lord. Commanding our soul to dwell in the Lord. You got a work to do. God is not going to do it all for you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We get ready to transition. But if you have, uh, you need have need of prayer, we still don't have our time opportunity. You can go ahead and give God a praise. Glory to God. Thank you for watching. We'd love to have you come visit us in person. God bless you. Amen. I know the God